All right, folks, let's do the last bit of our chemistry unit two notes. I said unit one in the past, I apologize, it's unit two. You know, these guys. Speaking of, let's take a quick look at that. Um, today's notes, I'm gonna go through um, some stuff on the PowerPoint that you don't actually have to write down. Um, okay, so we have talked about electrons already. So we talked about Bohr models and this idea of electron orbitals. We then figured out that only the outermost electrons in the outermost orbital count or matter for the most part, and they're called um, the valence electrons. And we've now learned how to do Lewis models, which are a much, much simpler way of depicting an atom. Um, it gives us a lot of information, definitely pared down, but maybe more useful. Today, we're gonna to talk about ions. So, um, so far, we have been assuming that all uh, all atoms that we've been working with are neutral. They have the same number of protons and electrons. However, in reality, that's not always true. So let's hop into this. Now, with this PowerPoint, you're gonna notice that some of the slides have a white background. If it has a white background, you don't need to write it down. If it has a yellow background, you do need to write it down. So I wanna explain what's going on with all this. So the general rule here is the octet rule. It means that atoms really like to have a full valence shell, which is the eight. So let's take a look at um, lithium here. Lithium does not have a full valence shell. It actually only has one electron in its valence shell. So in order to achieve that full valence shell, it has to start interacting with other atoms. And it has two options. It can either gain electrons or it can lose electrons. Either way, it's trying to go down to the most stable situation is that full valent shell. So if lithium loses, it, if it wants to gain electrons, it's going to need to gain seven. And then it has a full valent shell. That works pretty good. Or it could lose one. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Once it does that, it no longer has the same number of protons and electrons. Lithium has three protons. Just because it gains seven electrons doesn't mean its number of protons change at all. They're in the center. They don't, they're not affected at all. If it gains seven uh, protons, it in fact wouldn't even be lithium anymore. It would be uh, neon, a totally different element. So now that it has gained seven electrons, electrons have a negative charge. So we use this symbol here, the seven with a negative sign, to indicate that this lithium now has a negative seven charge. Great, cool. This is an ion. An ion is any time you have a, um, an atom that has a different number of electrons and protons and has a charge. Let's look at the other scenario. What if lithium gained electrons? Well, it would only need to gain one. Or lost, I'm so sorry. We'll take that back. What if lithium lost electrons? Well, it would only need to lose this one electron. And if it did, it would now have a full valence shell. I know it's not eight. I know that's the rule. But again, that first shell only could possibly contain two. So it's still a full shell. It still counts. In this case, it's lost one electron. So it now, this is kind of weirdly counterintuitive, but it does make perfect sense has a positive one charge. It still has three protons. Each proton is a plus one charge. It now only has two electrons. Each one is a minus one charge. In total, add the net is um, a plus one. So the question here is, which of these is more likely? 100% losing one electron is gonna be much easier. This lithium could probably find another atom to give that electron to. That's the other thing about this. They can't do this without other electrons, without other atoms. Otherwise, this lithium has to go around and try to find seven electrons from other atoms. That's way, way, way harder. This is so much easier. So lithium, in fact, will always form a plus one ion. So we call this a cation. A cation is um, a positively charged ion. An anion is a negatively charged uh, ion. All right, so that's lithium. Let's take a look at another example. 
All right, this is fluorine. I've got the Bohr model and the Lewis electron dot model both here. So fluorine has a total of seven electrons. Is that right? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, no, it, that's a lie. It has nine, sorry. <laughs> seven of them are valence. So there's two in the middle, um, seven along the outside. So again, two choices, gain electrons, lose electrons. It can gain one electron and there you go. Perfect, full valence shell, octet rule, all satisfied, there's eight electrons. Now this fluorine has a negative one charge because it has um, nine protons and now 10 electrons. The electrons win by one, electrons are negatively charged, therefore the fluorine is negatively charged. Or it can try to lose seven electrons. Again, not super likely, it would have a seven plus charge. This is way, way easier. So in fact, fluorine will always form an ion that is negative one. It's an anion because it's negative, not positive, which is cations. All right, so that is the explanation for why ions exist. When we get into compounds, we're gonna understand exactly how this happens. Um, neither fluorine nor lithium can just gain or just give electrons, like just toss them out into the ether, that doesn't work. Um, it has to find another atom that will accept or donate more protons. Uh, sorry, not protons. There are proton donors, but that's the only thing. Um, electrons. So for fluorine, fluorine has to go around and find an atom that will give up an electron. Uh, lithium has to find an atom that will take an electron, that will accept it. If we go through, I want to give you all a chance. Why don't you pause this video? and try to figure out what you think is going to happen with each of these scenarios. We've already done lithium and fluorine. What will these all these other elements do to get that full valence shell? Are they gonna give up electrons? Are they gonna lose electrons? And how many? So hopefully you went through and you tried this out and you can check your answers. So beryllium, um, has two valence electrons, it's really easy for it to lose those two, much, much easier than trying to gain six. So it's going to lose two electrons. It's going to then have a positive charge, it's going to be a cation, but because it lost two electrons, it's actually going to be a positive two. Boron is also going to lose three electrons to become positive three. Um, oxygen will gain two, because it's gaining two electrons, it will be a negative two charge. Nitrogen gains three, one, two, three, negative three charge. Um, carbon is kind of funny in that it could go either way, right? Like it has four, so gain four, lose four, eh, could go either way. Neon has no charge because neon already has a full octet. Why does it, it doesn't need any, it doesn't need to donate or accept any electrons. It's good as it is. So, excuse me. Just like valence electrons, these charges are a trend on the periodic table. Okay. So the purple here represents the valence electrons like we talked about in the last video. Um, all of the elements in this row, or this column, pardon, have one valence electron, and if they form ions, will be plus one. You'll notice also, just for a stylistic kind of thing, we tend to put the number first and the charge afterwards. All right. Every single element, any atom of these elements will form a plus two charge because of the valence of two. So you can actually write all of this on your periodic table, which um, I'll go back and do once we get back to the notes. But this trend continues. So for if I ask you what is the charge of phosphorus if it becomes an ion, it's negative three. All you got to do is find phosphorus, go up, find that number, well, bam. Um, it's the exact same kind of trend. Transition metals. These are funky. Um, they have rules, but they're extremely complicated and you kind of have to memorize them. So we're not going to. I could tell you silver is always a plus one. Why? No idea. It just is. Iron can sometimes be a plus two and sometimes be a plus three. How do you know? I don't know. You don't. Uh, zinc is always um, a plus two. I don't know why, but there you go. Copper is a plus one or a plus two. I don't know. Who knows? Who could say? Okay, so here's what I want you all to write on your sheet. Let's go through this again. 
Um, ions are atoms with different numbers of protons or electrons, uh, protons and electrons. It means that they've gained or lost electrons compared to the number of protons, and they have a charge. We can predict what the ion will be and what its charge will be. Cations are positively charged. Anions are negatively charged. It's just a word we use. Um, I remember this because the T in cation looks like a plus sign. So I always remember that cations are plus. I love these words because if you're not a chemist, you would probably pronounce this cation or anion, something like that. But if you are a chemist, you know it's cation and you know it's anion. Like I can't even see it the other way. It's crazy. Okay, an ion symbol is when you write the symbol of the element and right after it as a superscript, kind of higher up, you put its charge. So I've given you these examples here. You'll notice that lithium and fluorine actually has, lithium has a plus one charge and fluorine has a negative one charge. As chemists, we get really lazy and if we don't have to write the one, we don't have to. You know, if something is a plus two charge, we have to put the two because it's not one. Um, but we get a little lazy. So if you ever see lithium as a plus sign, it's just plus one. Fluorine's a minus one. Okay, so let me go to back to our notes so we can take a quick look at those and we'll grab the periodic table as well. Okay, so you should have some, uh, some of those ion symbols written down here. Um, you can copy out that, that whole thing, ion symbol. Um, I'll give you one more example just for funsies. Let's do sulfur. Uh, no, uh, yeah, sulfur's good. Sulfur. So looking at our periodic table, oh, we got to write these things in. You can write these charges in. So everything here is a plus one or one plus. Everything here is a two plus, three plus. It's either a four plus or a four minus. Three minus, two minus, one minus, no charge, does not exist. Okay. So if I ask you um, for the ion symbol of sulfur, you gotta find sulfur on the periodic table, here it is. You go up, it has six valence electrons, but the charge is negative two. So sulfur is two negative, that's its ion symbol. Lithium is a plus, fluorine is a minus. Again, fluorine is right here, you go up, it's negative one. Lithium is here, you go up, it's positive one. And that's true for all of these elements. Very easy to predict. Okay, um, was there anything else we needed to talk about with that? I felt like I was going, oh yes. Okay, this column is a little tricky. I'm gonna give you, tell you something. Metals are always positively charged. Non-metals are always negatively charged. You always get anions with non-metals. You always get cations with metals. So if you're coming to this part of the table and you're not sure, hey, is this a plus or a minus? It is based on this line that, you drew, that we have in the periodic table. So carbon is a non-metal because it's on this side of the table. Therefore, it is a negative four. Tin, is a metal. It's on this side of the line that we, the staircase. So it is a positive four. That's the difference. If you write both or either, I'll accept it, but that's the more correct answer. So carbon and silicon are both negative four. Germanium, tin, and lead are positive four. The same thing is actually, I think boron is just weird. So just like, don't even worry about boron. But if you put positive three, that's fine. Um, yeah, same thing is true. Antimony, again, is super weird. So you don't really have to worry about it too much. But it could be important for carbon or silicon or tin. Because tin is absolutely a cation. It's a metal. It's going gonna, it's gonna to lose electrons. It's not going to gain them, for sure. OK, so your next assignment is um, page four of your notes. You have actually already done this section and you've already done this electron dot section. The last section here is the middle. This is for ion symbols. This is where I want you to find the symbol and add the correct charge, all based on the periodic table. It shouldn't take you very long at all. It should be a snap. 
Uh, if it has no charge, you can either leave it blank or uh, you can leave the symbol just by itself or you can put that little zero up at the top like I did with Neon in the notes. Cool. All right. Because it's the last set of notes, let's go over um, everything again just to make sure we got this. Again, we should have everything written in here. You should have a vague idea of how the periodic table is set up. You should understand the structure of um, atoms. You should know what protons, neutrons, electrons, the nucleus, and the electron cloud are. You should know what elements, um, all the numbers on the periodic table, what all these numbers mean. Okay. Um, you should be able to calculate the average um, mass number and understand why all of these numbers are um, decimal points and not whole numbers. You should know um, where, how electron orbitals work in a very basic way, and you should be able to draw Bohr models. You should know about valence electrons, the octet rule, and be able to draw Lewis electron dot models. And now you should know what happens if the number of protons and electrons is not the same, if you lose or gain electrons, and you should be able to predict what the charge will be on any given element on the periodic table, provided that it's within these two sections. Don't worry about transition metals, no big deal. Don't worry about those. That's a whole other thing. Okay. That's all of it. That's the whole unit. Let's talk about the packet. For the packet, okay. so we're the packet. Sorry, <laughs> moving my camera around a little bit. Trying to get a slightly better view. Okay, at this point, page one, page two, done. We've already done this. We've done Bormont. We've done, uh, you should know, be able to know the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons based off of names, symbols, atomic numbers, mass numbers, all that. Um, you should be able to draw Bohr models. You can do electron dot models and ion symbols and calculate um, average um, mass number. So the last two pages, that's all the content is just on these four pages. The last two pages are your unit two test review. This is very similar to the types of problems you can expect on the test. You'll notice it's all the same kind of stuff over again. So if you go through all of this, the front page and the back, you can figure out um, what you will need to know for the test. And if you feel really good about this, that's great. Um, hopefully by this point, I have posted an answer key. Um, I'm not gonna give you the answers for everything. I usually just do the odds. So you still have to do the evens. Um, but you can at least check some of your answers. If you, as you're working, if you're not sure about something, just let me know. I'm happy to go over it with you um, and make sure that you're on the right track. So that's the end, y'all. Unit two, the very basics of chemistry. Um, our next unit is unit three, compounds. So we're gonna start figuring out what happens when elements interact, when atoms interact with each other. Um, we have just learned the alphabet of chemistry. That's what elements are, and that's what atoms are. We're about to start putting words together. That's compounds. Um, once we get words together, we can start writing sentences, which is reactions. Um, we also have to do moles and stoichiometry to help do all the math to really make like the grammar and math that makes all of it make sense. So let's keep going. Let me know if you need help. Um, it's been awesome so far and be excellent to each other, and I will see you for unit two. I mean three, I can't keep these straight in my head. <laughs>